Welcome back to Counting to Five, a podcast about the United States Supreme Court. In this episode, I'm going to preview a case called United States v. Microsoft, which is going to be argued on Tuesday, February 27th, 2018. Now, this case, United States v. Microsoft, is about extraterritoriality. And that is, what effect does a U.S. law have uh, when you go beyond the territorial uh, jurisdiction of the United States? And the specific law at issue here is known as the Stored Communications Act. And this is a law dating back to 1986. Uh, it's about, uh, it, it governs the access to electronic communications that are held by an internet service provider. So specifically uh, um, email, uh, what does the government have to do when the government wants to obtain someone's email record, someone's emails? Uh, so for, for um, a, a criminal investigation, if the government wants to get a hold of someone's email because they uh, think it, they, that it has uh, uh, evidence of criminal uh, activities, what, what can they do? And there are several methods provided in the Sword Communications Act that, that uh, allow the government to obtain emails. Part of it depends on how um, recent or old the emails are and uh, depends if they what type of information they want about those emails. But what's at issue is, is one provision that's known as a 2703 warrant. Now, this particular provision of the Stored Communications Act, um, it, it, it allows for these warrants, uh, known as these uh, Section 2703 warrants. These warrants are issued by a neutral judge. Um, they require the government, in order to get this kind of warrant, to uh, specifically describe the records that they're seeking and to show probable cause that these records contain evidence of a crime. Um, and so if they if they can go to a judge, present evidence, uh, probable cause that this the, these records will have evidence of a crime and describe the particular type of the emails that they're seeking, then they get this warrant and the subscriber, the email subscriber does not receive any notice of this. They get that warrant and then they can go with that warrant to the uh, email um, provider and and uh, demand that these uh, emails be turned over to the government. So the facts of this particular case, Microsoft operates several web-based email services. And the one that's at issue here is msn.com. And what happened is the United States got a warrant uh, related to a, a drug trafficking investigation for a msn.com email account um, and that, that, uh, that they believed had evidence of this drug trafficking investigation. Now they went to Microsoft uh, with this the warrant that they they received this 2703 warrant, and Microsoft refused to turn the emails over because those emails are stored not in the United States but on a server in Ireland. Um, the district court ordered Microsoft to turn the emails over. Microsoft appealed. The court of appeals reversed, said the warrant doesn't apply because uh, this is outside of the United States. This uh, the emails. Um, that are being sought are not physically located in the United States. They're located in Ireland. So um, the basic argument here, uh, the difference, the distinction between um, Microsoft, Microsoft and the United States in this case is, is where does the Sword Communications Act apply? Or when does it apply when you have international uh, situations? The, Microsoft says the Sword Communications Act really only applies when the emails are actually physically located in the United States. The United States says, on the other hand, when this warrant is served on Microsoft in the United States and Microsoft can access these and access and disclose these emails from the United States, then it should apply regardless of where in the world these things are stored. Um, and the, the basic there's there's kind of a, a couple of themes here that the, this this is it shows a conflict that, is, that uh, comes up. Um, fairly often in these uh, issues of um, of internet governance, and it's it, it's there's kind of a conflict between the the way we often think about the internet as this global network where um, where web pages and other data can be stored anywhere in the world, and just with a click of a button, it, it can it's uh, um, it can be displayed at you know any any computer any internet computer connected computer anywhere in the world. And, uh, and we kind of think of the cloud and uh, these uh, other uh, um, internet concepts as just, um, as just these, these kind of global uh, placeless uh, phenomena. Um, but in fact, everything is located somewhere 
um, and territorial ter- territory based uh, laws and and governance still plays a important role in um, in the the way that um, businesses and and uh, can, can uh, what, what they can and cannot do on the internet and what restrictions and what laws they they are uh, they have to follow um, and the the issue here is the particular section of the Stored Communications Act this is section 2703 um, it has language that says um, a governmental entity may require the disclosure by a provider of electronic communication service of the contents of a wire or electronic communication uh, and it goes on to say by obtaining a warrant um, now that says nothing about where this applies. It doesn't say anything about the territorial application. Um, everyone agrees that there must be some sort of territorial limit, but there's disagreement over exactly what that territorial limit is. No one argues that this actually uh, authorizes the United States to demand everything from anyone anywhere in the world, even though it was a foreign country a company completely located in a foreign country dealing only with foreign citizens and everything was stored abroad. Uh, no one argues that it applies there. But the question is, where does the territorial limit apply? Is it, uh, as, uh, as the United States has, has, has argued, when there's control over the data from within the U.S.? So if there's a U.S.-based um, corporate presence and they have access and control to the data, even if it's outside of the U.S., does it matter where the email account owner is located, whether that person is a U.S. national or is located in the United States? Um, just wh- whether the, the nexus of the investigation is in the United States, or as Microsoft has, uh, has argued, is, is it limited to when the data, the data that's actually sought is stored, physically stored in the United States? Um, then the statute doesn't uh, explicitly say. Um, and there, there's a general principle in law that's called the presumption against extraterritoriality, which says that when uh, Congress writes a law and doesn't specify a, a geographic limits to where that law applies. There's a general presumption that it only applies within the the uh, the territory of the United States. It doesn't have extraterritorial application. But here, that doesn't get us uh, to the answer here. Even if we we uh, assume that that applies, it doesn't tell us what basis we're drawing that territorial limit on. Because the United States says, well, yes. That that uh, presumption against extraterritoriality applies, but but that applies to the question of where um, the the uh, whether the entity has control of the data from from within the United States. Um, so that presumption against extraterritoriality doesn't get us the whole way there. So the question is, how do we characterize the statute, and 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 where does the statute? Can we can we look at the statute and figure out where it, it is drawing a line, and what are the implications of drawing the line in different ways? So the United States makes a number of arguments. I'll kind of run through the argument, the basic, the main arguments on each side of this case. And the United States argues that the the focus of the statute, the important part about the statute is disclosure of of user data. So the issue is not where the data is stored originally, but where is this data being disclosed? And here that's happening domestically. They're asking Microsoft to turn this data over in the United States to United States uh, law enforcement officials. Um, and they point out that the statute places no limits on Microsoft as far as its internal access to the data. So Microsoft under the Stored Communications Act, the Stored Communications Act places various privacy-based limits on um, the ability of uh, providers to disclose customer data, customer emails, but it places no limits on the internal access. Microsoft um, can access uh, users' documents that even if they're overseas or otherwise outside of the territory of the United States. Um, and the U.S. argues that user privacy is really only violated once that data is disclosed. And so if, that when that disclosure happens domestically, that's within the, um, the uh, territorial bounds of this statute. Um, they also make the argument that this warrant, um, it really... Even though, it, even though it's, it's uh, described in, in, as a warrant, it's the 2703 warrant, um, it actually functions more like a subpoena. And subpoenas are, are orders that, that are frequently used in a variety of settings to obtain data from companies or individuals. And when, when someone issues a subpoena, for example, to a company like, like, uh, like Microsoft, um, a subpoena doesn't 
authorize the government to to go in and search. But it, it, what it is, is it does is order the recipient of the subpoena. So Microsoft, for example, to comply with the terms of the order and um, subpoenas usually apply broadly to any information that's under the control of the recipient um, without regard to where that uh, data is specifically located. Um, the government argues that even though this is titled a warrant, it really functions like a subpoena and the same rules that apply to subpoenas should apply here. And it's really be because Microsoft has access and control of this data, that's all that matters. And, uh, and that should, that should, that's, that's enough. Um, they also make some kind of practical arguments. They argue that um, taking the territorial approach allows deliberate circumvention of the United States' access to, uh, for law enforcement purposes just by storing, choosing to store the data ab abroad because it was just a, a business decision by Microsoft to store this particular data in Ireland rather than in, in the United States. Um, a company providing email services could just try to avoid um, being subject to US law enforcement by storing all of its data in a nation, uh, foreign nation, where it was difficult for the United States to gain access to that, even if the company had um, the exact same access to that data internally that they would have had if they had stored it uh, just right here in the United States. Um, it would also allow individual users who wanted to uh, avoid um, easy uh, access by the United States, uh, it would, it would uh, incentivize you know, some criminal user who, was a, who didn't want to be subject to these US law enforcement searches to just choose a email provider uh, based in a foreign country who stores all the data abroad in a foreign country. And then uh, it would allow them to, to uh, dodge this access, even, even if um, the United States had uh, access to that, even if that company was subject to the United States' uh, access because it was based in the United States, the, uh, the data would be safe because it was stored abroad and users could take advantage of this. Um, now, the United States has uh, a, a series of agreements that are known as mutual legal assistance treaties, and or uh, referred to as MLATs for short, mutual legal assistance treaty or MLAT. And these are um, agreements, uh, international agreements on cooperation in law enforcement, and uh, they provide methods for when when one country seeks information for law enforcement purposes uh, that's in, a, in another country's juris jurisdiction of another country, they can go through these MLAT processes to obtain that uh, information from the foreign country. Um, the government argues that these MLATs uh, are really not sufficient for this, this particular situation. And, and there's a few reasons they say that. They say that, first of all, the United States d doesn't have these MLATs with everywhere. They, they only have them for maybe around half the countries in the world. And, and the rest, uh, there just isn't a tree in place right now. And the other is that these, these can be very slow processes. They can sometimes take months or in some cases even years to work through the entire process and eventually get data from some foreign country. And that's just not practical, not really usable. Um, the government also makes a few arguments uh, about why using a strict territorial pro approach is really unworkable in practice. Now here, um, this was actually a relatively simple scenario in that uh, Microsoft uh, could say that the data that they were seeking for this particular email account was stored on a server in Ireland. Uh, but that may not always be the case. The data, data for a particular account or a particular user may not have a single unified stable location. Uh, the example that's been used frequently is Google. Uh, and Google actually, in some cases, will divide a user's data over multiple different servers uh, that could potentially be in different countries around the world. Um, so a user may have an email account with uh, tens or hundreds or thousands of emails in it, and those emails may be spread over computers in various different parts of the world. And in some cases, a single email may even be stored separately from its attachments. So the email might be on a server in one place and the attachments might be in a, a, in a, a different server, possibly even in a different country. Um, if the government wanted to piece together that email data from a particular user's account, they might need to obtain it from multiple different countries and that could require going through the cumbersome MLAT process uh, multiple times in multiple different jurisdictions. Um, there's also a possibility that the data could be frequently moved. Um, Google moves around user data just for purposes of its own network management and and uh, and and handling you know responsiveness and and just other internal uh, reasons. And 
that can be uh, the there that could prevent uh, create uh, timing problems if uh, the government has to go through these international approval methods and the data is stored in country A and the government starts walking through the steps to seek assistance from country A. And by the time they uh, are moving through the process, it's been moved to a server in country B uh, for reasons having nothing to do with the investigation, but just the uh, practices of that uh, internet service provider. So um, they argue that that's just not, uh, not really workable. Uh, another argument, um, it comes kind of from a different direction. The United States argues that the United States itself has uh, certain um, obligations, uh, international obligations that require it to have this sort of access. So for one, one example is the United States is a, uh, is a signatory to a treaty known as the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime. And under that convention, uh, signatories to, to the, the convention ag uh, ha agree or they, uh, they um, say that they, they, they will have legal authority to access computer data that's under the control of persons in their territory. Um, so that if, uh, if they're going to cooperate with other countries on a cybercrime investigation and um, the person uh, of interest is in a particular location, every signatory from the, the treaty is supposed to uh, have access, uh, have means, legal means of accessing data that's under that person's control. Um, the argument here is that the uh, the uh, strictly territorial interpretation of these warrants would mean that the United States is not in compliance because there may be people within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States uh, who the United States no longer has access uh, under this process to their data. And so that would, that would be out of compliance. Um, a, a similar argument was actually made um, by the United Kingdom in a amicus brief in this case, uh, arguing that this territorial view would interfere with United States cooperation with uh, requests from the UK for data from US providers so that the United Kingdom, uh, when it has law enforcement uh, investigations that involve a United States person, they seek assistance from the United States to obtain that data. But if that data is uh, in some third country, the United States would no longer have access to that through this 2703 warrant process. So that would interfere with that type of problem. Um, another an issue that's been raised uh, that I'll come back to in a, in a few minutes by Microsoft is that um, the United States' approach, uh, the, the argument that anything um, that's under the control of, of someone in the United States can be uh, ordered to be turned over regardless of where it's located, that creates some international conflicts of law because other countries have, uh, for example, data privacy laws that require countries to safeguard the data of their customers and to not turn it over without certain types of legal process. And that the United States' demands for this type of data would conflict with those data protection laws other places and place a com company in a bind where it's unable to both comply with the law enforcement uh, request from the United States and the, with the data privacy laws of another country. Um, the United States has argued that that's a largely speculative concern. They don't think it's as serious as it is. And they've, they argued that the government is able to exercise discretion where there is such a conflict. So where the United States is aware that the request would create a conflict or where the company comes back to the United States and says that they're in, they would be violating uh, some other country's laws by complying with it, that the United States could work with them and, and exercise its own discretion to avoid that type of conflict. Now, there's a lot of amicus briefs in this case. The U.S. Uh, was supported by a number of U.S. states who, who uh, argue that the um, law enforcement action uh, access uh, should not be uh, restricted territorially. Um, but there's quite a few foreign governments and foreign organizations um, that opposed it, often arguing, uh, emphasizing either um, the importance of territoriality uh, for privacy protections and data um, protection laws in various countries and uh, the need for, for um, respect for foreign law and, and, and the, the dangers of one country asserting kind of a unilateral control over things that reach out um, internationally. And also often emphasizing the important role that treaties can play in resolving these issues rather than relying solely on an, a, um, an older uh, US uh, unilateral United States law. So let me turn for a minute to Microsoft on the other side of the uh, of the case and some of the arguments that they 
make there. So they, they focus, Microsoft focuses on some of the specific language of the statute and focuses on the, on the, the statute is, refers to communications and electronic storage. Um, so it's, it's, it's talking about data stored electronically which uh, suggests that the, the location of storage um, should be the focus of, of where you draw the territorial boundaries, not disclosure, which isn't kind of the main focus of the statute. So disclosure isn't, isn't, isn't really the, the main focus. So that shouldn't be what you're looking at when you're deciding uh, where do we draw the line on the, this presumption against extraterritorial application. Um, and they argue that just as a matter of United States law enforcement, um, a seizure occurs just where the data is stored. So the United States is actively would be seizing this data um, in the territory of Ireland if if uh, if they're demanding that Microsoft take that uh, uh, turn over that data that's currently stored on a server in Ireland. Um, <clears throat> uh, then Microsoft also argues that um, the interpretation pushed by the United States would um, be have some kind of very broad and, and, and potentially damaging effects if taken to its logical con conclusion, because it would basically say um, that if, if the focus is just disclosure and if this law only applies to the United States disclosure of uh, this data, then the, the flip side of that is it suggests that the Stored Communications Act actually provides no protection for the foreign disclosure of, um, of, of information. Uh, and this would apply to foreign disclosure um, to to uh, any other government or or uh, whatever. If, if you're saying that where we draw the territorial limits is where the data is being disclosed, then why couldn't a U.S. company with data on a U.S. person stored in the United States turn that data over to a foreign government or some foreign party uh, with uh, no uh, no issue under the Stored Communications Act because there was no disclosure in the U.S. in the United States, um, for example. There's been concerns about um, China seeking uh, information on uh, dissidents, and and there's been concern that China has has sought or has tr has uh, been very interested in seeking information from United from American company companies on uh, Chinese dissidents in order to kind of crack down on on political speech that's dis disfavored. Um, well, on, under this interpretation, Microsoft says, um, if a U.S. company uh, had data stored even in the United States, but they had a presence in China. China could demand under this that the uh, the U.S. turn over that information in China, and um, the the company would currently, if so, something like that happened, the U.S. company would at least be in the position to argue that they could not do that because the United States law protections, data protections on the United States law, would make that. Um, illegal under United States law, but under the interpretation where disclosure, the, the United the Stored Communications Act only applies to U.S. disclosures, then they would no longer have that argument. That would be perfectly legal and they could do that. Um, it also invites the invasion by U.S. law enforcement of, uh, of, of foreign privacy. Um, the, for example, uh, you, could, you could think of demands for sensitive government documents from a foreign uh, foreign company that, that has data of uh, foreign government officials, for example. Um, and, um, and, and, the, and the argument is that the Stored Communications Act doesn't just apply to the federal government, but, but also gives uh, the authority to um, state and local law enforcement to, uh, to obtain these electronic uh, data. And so th this would allow, for example, local law enforcement to dig into sensitive uh, foreign information from foreign countries. And as long as it was disclosed in the United States uh, to argue that there was uh, um, no extraterritorial concern uh, about that. Um, the Microsoft also responds to some of the uh, United States' arguments. Um, the government's concerns about circumvention uh, would also equally apply to non-digital searches. For example, a physical item uh, that was stored in a safe deposit box, um, a, a country or individual seeking to uh, uh, make that less accessible to United States law enforcement could store that in a uh, physical uh, safe deposit box located in a foreign jurisdiction, and the United States wouldn't have easy access to that, would have to go through foreign processes 
uh, you know, treaty processes in order to obtain uh, that uh, item that was that was placed uh, in, in some foreign location. Uh, same thing with, a, for example, a United States company, uh, think of, for example, a hotel chain that had hotels in located in foreign countries. Um, in the United States, law enforcement could get a warrant to uh, be allowed to search a room in the hotel or, or, or to ask hotel staff to search on behalf of the government uh, under a warrant. Um, they would have no, they have no such access to a uh, hotel room located in a foreign country, even if it's the United States uh, company that, that uh, controls that hotel. They have to go through foreign processes in order to get access. Um, and then Microsoft uh, points to the uh, possibility of conflicts with foreign governments, um, especially related to these uh, data protection laws. Um, and they point out that uh, foreign governments, including Ireland, protested when the warrant was issued here. So this was an issue that, that foreign governments actually did um, uh, did, uh, did raise uh, issues about. The, um, the European Commission has said that the EU's uh, general data protection regulation uh, would apply regardless of the existence of a 2703 warrant. Um, so uh, that, that the only exception provided for law enforcement purposes under Europe's data protection laws is uh, is when uh, data is sought pursuant to a treaty, uh, not just a unilateral action by some foreign government. Um, and, uh, and there's actually an amicus brief uh, that talked about uh, companies that have actually faced uh, legal sanctions um, in Brazil from the Brazilian government for complying with uh, United States requests for data. Um, Microsoft also specifically responds to the argument that, uh, that the government makes about uh, uh, treating these warrants, these 2703 warrants, uh, as equivalent to a subpoena. Um, and they, they make a few arguments. They argue that first they say there's, there's no basis for blurring together warrants and subpoenas. This is referred to explicitly as a warrant and follows the processes for uh, obtaining a warrant from a court. Um, so just presumptively, this, is, this should be treated as a warrant, not a subpoena. They also point out that subpoenas uh, they normally apply to a company's own records. Uh, so you can, if you're subpoenaing records from Microsoft about its own business practices, its internal policies and records, that's one thing. Um, but subpoenas generally don't give you access to data that's being held in trust for a customer. So you, you can't uh, generally subpoena Microsoft to obtain Microsoft's customers' email data. Um, and they also argue that the language in authorities that provide for subpoenas, so statutes and rule court rules that allow subpoenas, generally have very different language. They usually have explicit language referring to access to materials or information in the possession, custody, or control of the recipient of the subpoena. But the Stored Communications Act doesn't use that language, instead just refers to materials in electronic storage, um, again, which, which uh, Microsoft says uh, brings you back to the focus on the, the storage itself, uh, which would suggest a territorial um, limit on where that data is stored. Um, and uh, the, so, so that's, that's, that's kind of some of the arguments they make against the subpoena argument. Um, they also argue that the government's argument about circumvention um, by, by storing things in a foreign, uh, in a foreign location uh, is actually already possible, even under the government's uh, interpretation, by using a wholly foreign email provider. So there are email providers who are located completely outside of the United States and have no U.S. presence, um, and their email isn't accessible even under the United States' theory because there's no U.S. entity with control over that data. Uh, there's also some other practical arguments. That One is that the position being taken by the United States government is further undermining United States uh, tech companies. It's, it creates an international uh, uh, fear or disincentive for foreign companies to uh, want to use United States providers of uh, technology services because they're placing their data by having uh, by using a U.S. provider. They're placing themselves under um, the United States' ability to to access and, and go through the, their their data. And this has already it's been an issue. For U.S. tech companies, since um, uh, disclosures a few years ago of uh, United States intelligence um, data gathering from U.S. Uh, providers, and that's caused certain foreign companies and foreign countries to very publicly say that they were either discouraging or, or trying to prevent 
the foreign companies from using certain U.S. Uh, internet providers uh, for data storage because of the concern that the United States government was uh, abusing their access to that data. And so this kind of uh, the argument for Microsoft is that this uh, does this to, has the same uh, will have the same negative effect for U.S. companies. Um, they also refer to the MLAT process. That's those mutual legal assistance treaties between com- uh, com- uh, countries. And they point to the, the MLAT. In this case, the United States and Ireland, uh, they have such an arrangement. Um, Ireland cooperates fully with these requests that come from the United States. And I- Ireland uh, is uh, apparently can respond to urgent requests from U.S. law enforcement within days, so not the months or years that are uh, of concern. And Ireland actually had filed an amicus brief in this case and very explicitly stated that they were uh, fully willing to cooperate in this particular case under the MLAT and that the United States could have pursued this MLAT process and did not need to go this unilateral route. So, you know, that's just a, um, you know, that, that's particular to to Ireland in this particular case and doesn't necessarily speak to the broader question of uh, the Stored Communication Act's scope uh, generally, but it's just an interesting fact about the United States' approach here. And the big issue uh, that Microsoft kind of raises that brings up is that, yes, there, there, there does seem to be a um, questionable fit between this Sword Communications Act, which is this 1980s era law, uh, law um, and it may not completely fit with modern email practices. There was no thought back in the 1980s that some person here in the United States might have their email data scattered across uh, a dozen different countries across the world. Um, the the internet as we know it now just uh, did not exist um, like that at the time. But the argument is that, that those gaps or those poor fits to the extent they exist are not the uh, the courts to fix. Those are problems, if they if they are problems, those are problems that were created uh, by a failure to, uh, to update this 1980s law to fit modern realities. And that's a job for Congress and Congress can go in at any time and create fixes that would try and address these territorial concerns, um, either just through updating and improving the Sword Communications Act to make more clear how it should apply to these extraterritorial assistance or extraterritorial situations, or, um, or, or maybe even better to engage in more kind of vigorous multilateral um, tree uh, agreements in order to try and uh, uh, have more uniform international processes to obtain this type of data. So that uh, pretty much sums it up for the major arguments on each side of this case. Um, This case will be argued on Tuesday, February 27th. And again, as with all of the court's cases, opinion can come down any time before the court leaves for its summer recess at the end of June. And uh, that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to Counting to Five on YouTube or your audio podcast app of choice. And for timely coverage of the latest developments at the court, please check out Counting to Five's weekly YouTube live streams. And uh, in those live streams, you can ask your own questions in the live chat and we do our best to answer them. We're currently broadcasting these every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time, but please check the Counting to Five YouTube channel to see when the next scheduled live stream will be happening. And I'm always looking for feedback, and please leave a comment or send me an email at mike at countingtofive.com. Thank you for listening. This has been Counting to Five.